I'm Jim Doty. I am the founder and director of CCARE, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And our mission is to really understand compassion at a deep level, and specifically the neuroscience, as well as understanding the peripheral physiology, and develop techniques that, if you will, allow someone to uh, increase or maximally potentiate their ability to be compassionate. And why is that important? We know from a variety of studies nowadays that when somebody is compassionate with intent, it really changes everything. It improves your peripheral physiology, it decreases your blood pressure, it boosts your immune system, and shockingly so, it improves your interaction with others as well as oftentimes uh, with your partner and your children. Uh, we've developed uh, interventions or techniques to do so. One of those is a compassion cultivation training program, which has proved quite effective and now is being taught throughout the world. And we have uh, ever-increasing empiric data in regard to uh, the benefit of that type of intervention. And one of the other things which I actually find the most fun is what we're here for tonight, and that is uh, to engage individuals who by uh, example lead compassionate lives, and as a result of that, not only impact uh, many, many people, but also, uh, if you will, uh, find deep meaning in their own lives. And hopefully what this does is it spurs all of us uh, to continue in this work and promote, if you will, uh, this agenda. Uh, how many of you have been to our conversations on compassion? Were any of you here for AMA? Did you guys enjoy that? Uh, I was just with, uh, at the Vatican with Pope Francis and AMA and some other spiritual leaders, and uh, it's always an interesting experience to uh, hang around with people who, uh, by their actions in the world, uh, also are uh, incredibly compassionate. It's really my pleasure this evening to have a conversation on compassion with Jeff Weiner. Do any of you know who he is? Okay. Uh, well, I'll limit my introduction. I had about 30 minutes, but now I'll cut it to about four words or five. Uh, so I met Jeff a few years ago, and we had a wonderful conversation. And uh, as I think all of you know, he is the CEO of uh, LinkedIn, which is uh, the world's largest uh, professional, I guess, social network. How many people are on LinkedIn? You don't have to do that because Jeff is sitting here. Uh, uh, it's been a very successful company. I think, is it over 400 million? 350 okay, uh, million uh, individuals who are signed up, and it uh, uh, has revenues, I think, exceeding $2 billion. And the extraordinary thing, though, about that is that uh, Jeff, from the beginning, has oriented this company around the concept of being a compassionate leader. And uh, many feel, and I believe, that that is one of the major reasons why he has been so successful. So uh, I'm hoping tonight uh, we can share with him his story, uh, the trajectory of his career, and also uh, be inspired uh, by his wisdom. You know, uh, I think he's becoming now a guru, so uh, uh, he's not in robes yet, but uh, he's heading in that direction, I think. So without further ado, uh, Jeff Weiner. <laughs> I don't know about the guru thing. <laughs> oh, I've read that in articles. Yeah, no guru. <clears throat> well, great to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you. Following your session with the Pope, I'm not sure how I'm going to... You just name drop the Pope. I don't know where you go from there. Yeah. Just yeah. hanging out with the Pope. Well, it, it could have been the Dalai Lama, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, speaking of the Dalai Lama... Uh, <laughs> Uh, one of your favorite books is actually The Art of Happiness. Yeah. When did you uh, first read that book? I was probably somewhere in the order of uh, 29 or 30. Okay. So it was uh, 15 years ago. It, um, 
speaking of sort of going back in time a little bit, I know, uh, and you've said this, uh, I, I think, a number of times, um, really one of your inspirations, or at least uh, one of the things that has motivated you to achieve, I think, is your father telling you every night that you were capable of being anything or, or doing anything. Um, obviously, you're close to your father. How, uh, and I think you said, he said this every night to you for, do you feel that that has really sat in and was a big contributor uh, to your success? Yeah, uh, it, it, it was. And it's interesting because I didn't recognize it until more recently. So uh, when I was a little kid, uh, every night before I go to bed, my dad uh, would say, uh, before putting me to bed, you can do anything you set your mind to. And he said it so often that uh, it started to just go in one ear and out the other. And it was like a bromide, like eat your vegetables. You, know, you don't pay a lot of attention to that stuff when you're growing up. But it became a fundamental part of me and, and who I was. I took it for granted, but it was there. And later in life, when thinking about career pathing, when mentoring others, uh, it would always start with the question, what is it you ultimately want to achieve? And if you know what it is you ultimately want to achieve, I think you are that much closer to making it happen. Uh, as long as you're optimizing for passion and skill and not one at the exclusion of the other. And he instilled that in me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very much a part of the way I have gone about developing my career. So you have two children. Uh, so are they tired of you saying that to them? Yeah. You know, it's so funny you ask that. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, our daughters are six, and our youngest is going to turn four in several weeks. And I, I do say it. And uh, I say, you can do anything you, you set your mind to. And the other day, I overheard my daughter, the six-year-old. She, <laughs> she was on a play date. She was playing with a friend. You got to make sure that they're hearing it the way it was intended, because she was doing something with her friend. She wasn't able to do exactly what she wanted. And she said, my dad told me I can do anything I want. <laughs> this literally just happened. So I didn't know you were going to ask me about the kids. So I was like, mental note, note to self. Yes. Very specific about the context here. And so the, ne the next time I said it to her, I was like, you know, this isn't just about doing anything you want, especially when it's with other people where you may need to compromise and be compassionate, <laughs> put yourself in their shoes, and understand what they want too. It's about setting your mind to things that you really dream of doing and then making that happen. And you can do anything you set your mind to as long as you want to work hard and so forth and so on. But yeah, you got it. And then she then go, but can I still get anything I want? <laughs> no, although we, we do have kind of a running joke now. Uh, so uh, sometimes she'll ask and she doesn't get it. And we have Sonos in the house, so you can quickly access any song, play it from any room, and I will play the stones, you can't always get what you want, and we'll all start singing together, which is kind of a, a fun way to, to dismiss that part of the discussion. We really do. can't always get what you want. The next Rolling Stone. Nah. Um, and continuing on, uh, on this vein, uh, what, uh, I think uh, after you finished Wharton, you were at, uh, was it Braxton? Wow, you've done your homework. Yeah. No, I just looked around. A yeah. yeah. Um, and from there, I think yeah, you wrote a letter to your father. Yes. And uh, maybe you can tell us because you still keep that letter. I do. Yeah, it's uh, yellowed by now. But I feel like Oprah. So, you know, like <laughs> have you ever seen Oprah with these cards? That, uh, although I, I can't bring myself to carry these cards, so. I, I, I go through this stuff, and then I'm wondering if I can ever remember it. So I'm You're doing a good job. Or like, uh, was James Lipton from Inside the Actor Studio? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, he also has both. Right, got, like, right, right. A lot of cards. We can end on that survey <laughs> question. So um, I was at Braxton, uh, first job out of school, strategic management consulting, and very quickly realized I didn't want to pursue a career as a consultant. But it was a wonderful opportunity as an analyst to get exposed to a lot of different industries and try to uh, solve a number of different problems. And one of the best parts was, as a 22, 23-year-old, I was sitting in rooms with very senior executives and had a chance to watch them make decisions. So it was really valuable. But I knew early on I didn't want to be a consultant full-time. So I started thinking about what I wanted to do next. And it was my dad who said, you know, if you get a chance, uh, jot down your thoughts 
about what it is you want to do. Because the more specific you can be, I think the more likely it will be to happen, that you can make it happen. You can start thinking through the, the, the various avenues, the people that you know, et cetera. So uh, this is roughly spring of 1994. And I essentially wrote to him a mock cover letter and said, uh, recognizing the evolution of digital technology, which I had been exposed to as an undergrad, uh, the internet, uh, recognizing the growth of that and based on uh, a longstanding interest and love of media and an interest in education, in particular education reform, I said that I'd be very interested in working in convergence. That's how we were describing it at the time, which was the convergence, quite literally, that would be made possible through digital technologies of the communications industry, the media industry, the entertainment industry, the world of education, et cetera. I wanted to play a role there. And I thought that it would be less about the technology that would define the successful companies and more about the content, more about the program in a, in a media context, not a software context. And that if I could, I would like to be able to learn from the people running the studios and running the media conglomerates because these people, Steve Ross, the guy that created Time Warner, Ted Turner, Rupert Murdoch, that was the folks that you would think of in that vein back then. Those people not only understood business, but they understood content. Um, it was referred to in Hollywood as a, a golden gut. And that if I could somehow be exposed to them, hopefully I'd be able to learn uh, how to do the same. And. Uh, so I said, ultimately, I'd, I'd love to be able to, to start as a, say, a member of their corporate development team or something that would be possible for someone as young. I didn't have a lot of experience at the time, but I loved strategy. I was doing strategy. And that was it. And <laughs> within several weeks of sending this to my father, starting to think about it, my office mate got a call from a headhunter at Warner Brothers who asked him if he'd be interested in the strategic planning analyst job in the corporate development group there. And he had just submatriculated, he just accepted at Harvard Business School, no offense to the Stanford folks in the audience. And um, so he said, no, I wouldn't be interested, but I, I know someone that would be. And he passed them along to me, and within you know, several weeks I got the job. And so I started at Warner Brothers in the corporate development group in September of 1994, and the, uh, the guy who had created the corporate development group there, right after I joined, uh, basically said Warner Brothers needed an interactive division. And that would have an online component, a CD-ROM component, and what at the time he was calling out-of-home interactive entertainment or kiosks. That fell by the wayside. No one was interested in online. No one understood it. They all wanted to focus on CD-ROM. I volunteered for online. And uh, I wrote my first online business plan in December of 1994 for Warner Brothers. So that's how it all started. Now, by this time, had uh, you read Be Digital? You really have done your homework, yeah. Yes, so uh, uh, anyone in the audience familiar with Being Digital? Nicholas Negroponte, he was the guy who created the MIT Media Lab. So uh, shortly after uh, joining Warner Brothers, um, I was reading uh, Wired, the print version, and uh, it was literally, it was a couple of weeks after I started Warner Brothers, so it would be around September of 1994. And there was a book review. That was one of the best parts of Wired Magazine. So they were covering some great books, much read. And um, they were raving about being digital. And so I got a copy of the book. I started to read it. And before I got through a few pages, essentially Negroponte was positing that anything that can, could be converted from an atom to a bit would be. So I looked it around. I was new at Warner Brothers. And I said, wow, this whole place is going to change. So when the head of corporate development said, would anyone be interested in writing the online component of this plan, I volunteered. And uh, I had gotten my first online account earlier that year while I was still at Braxton. It was AOL. And uh, I had uh, had an experience with AOL very early on. I stumbled across a site that had literally just started a few weeks after I joined, uh, or it may have even been a few weeks prior. It was called The Motley Fool. Sure. Yeah. Wow, a lot of heads went up. That's interesting. So the Gardner brothers, in 1994, they had been writing a financial newsletter in print, and they decided to move it online and try AOL. And so very early on, this extraordinary community of individual investors came together and started reverse engineering everything you would possibly want to know about products and services, in particular companies, based on these investment theses 
And one of them was for a company called iOmega. Oh. And they were about to go bankrupt, and they introduced something called the Zip Drive, which was uh, portable storage. And um, it just went, cr I mean, it just took off. It didn't end that well, but it, it took off. iOmega, Motley Fool is doing great. I still keep in touch with Tom. And at any rate, I just saw the power of it between that and my own personal experiences in the book and then my positioning at Warner Brothers, it just all came together. But I do think to your question, to my dad's point as a kid growing up, it was about knowing what I wanted. I don't think any of that was coincidence. I don't, to a large extent, and we could get a whole philosophical debate about it, I don't necessarily believe in coincidence. I don't think things are predetermined or preordained. I'm not a fatalist, but I do believe you manifest things explicitly and implicitly by virtue of knowing what it is you want. You manifest that energy in the world. You attract certain opportunities to yourself. You attract certain people. People know what you want. They create opportunities for you. They facilitate opportunities. And that's been the story of my career. So you left Time Warner. And how did you go to your next job? I was smiling because it's like, this is your life. I'm expecting like a big. Oh, we're going to get to the tough. My parents are going to walk out in a second. My kids. <laughs> Uh, so Warner Brothers, uh, in the days following uh, that business plan exercise, uh, the online division was approved. The CD-ROM uh, part of it was not, interestingly enough, because that's where everyone was really focused. No one really cared about the online stuff at the time. And CD-ROM, the belief was there, there was too great an inventory risk. And Warner Communications and Warner Brothers had had a, a pretty bad experience with Atari for some of the business historians in the audience, they invested very heavily in E.T., the game, not the movie. It didn't work out very well. There was recently a documentary that was filmed. Right, wasn't that where they were digging them up out they in the desert? Digging and, uh, the cartridges up. Yeah, it right, was like yeah. uh, Capone's vault. Like People didn't know if it was true or not, and it was true. They had buried all these Atari cartridges in the desert. I think it was Arizona or something. At any rate, uh, not a big appetite for inventory risk. Online didn't carry the inventory risk. They approved online. I ended up leaving corporate development, moving over to online full time. I think it was April of 1996. And myself and a couple of other guys helped build this division. And it was an incredibly exciting time. And, and Warner Brothers uh, was very early on in trying to really invest and figure out how to make it work. And it was exciting. But we believed that we would need to be an independent entity to truly be competitive uh, with regard to how the digital landscape was evolving. And there were plans to be spun out publicly, and it wasn't just going to be us. Uh, Pathfinder, which was the digital sure. version of the print magazines. Uh, CNN Interactive was doing some really trailblazing stuff earlier on. And uh, so there was a, a lot of back and forth about the best ways to position these divisions uh, for success. And should there be subsidiaries? Should they be publicly spun out? And then, of course, AOL uh, merged with Time Warner. So your entity was Entertainedum? Was that yeah. what it was? Entertainedum. I'm going to stop saying how impressive it is that you know all this stuff. So uh, uh, I'm just going to think it. Uh, but uh, uh, and <laughs> So after that merger, what happened? So uh, I mean, first things first, we said, OK, so we're going to proceed with the plan. They said, no, uh, we're not going to be pit, uh, spinning out uh, the divisions anymore because uh, the combination of Time Warner and AOL is a digital company. That was the whole reason for the, for the combination. So without that, I think some of us who had stayed longer than we otherwise might have ended up leaving. And uh, myself, one of the executives who had started that division, ended up joining Terry Semmel, who had been the chairman and CEO of Warner Brothers. And Terry had started a private equity company, and we joined him. And uh, we were uh, looking for a vehicle that we could invest in and take a controlling interest in. And uh, we found that asset. And this you probably don't know. I'd be extraordinarily impressed. But it was uh, Puma. No, no. So I, uh, we were thinking about making an investment in Puma. Puma, the athletic? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Which would have been an incredible investment. They've done really well. And um, uh, a couple of months before that was finalized, uh, Terry got a call from Jerry Yang, the founder of Yahoo. And right around the time of the call, just a few weeks prior, uh, there was an announcement that Yahoo was going to be making a leadership transition. So Tim Google, was, the CEO, was going to be transitioning out. And Terry mentioned Jerry had called him and that Terry was going to be visiting to help Jerry perhaps give him advice. And I said, Terry, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me, based on your background and the way Yahoo's positioned and where they're going, it wouldn't surprise me if they asked you to be the CEO. And he said, no, there's no way they're going to do that. He just wants advice. We met at that conference, and uh, we connected. I'm just going to go up. I'll, I'll help him out. 
flies up, comes back down, walks into the office, and he's laughing. And he says, you were right. I said, what do you mean? He said, they asked if I'd be interested in being the CEO. I was like, yeah, I, I knew it, I knew it, so let's get back to work. He said, no, no, I'm going to do it. And I was like, what? It was like a double take from the cartoons. You know? And um, I said, uh, I'm not sure you could fully appreciate uh, how intense this is going to be. Uh, you know, this is, I've been doing digital now. Uh, at Warner Brothers, I was doing digital. I was immersed in it five, five plus years. And uh, it's, a, it's a different beast. It's a different animal. You've got this dot-com implosion. Yahoo's one of the highest profile companies in the world. Uh, this is a bit of a turnaround situation, even though it's great brand, great assets. I'm sure it's great people. But this is going to be, like, seriously intense. And he's like, no, this is it. This is the next chapter. I think it's an extraordinary asset. So I'm going to do it, and you're going to come with me. I was like, check please. No, I'm not coming with you. I love my life down here. I'm really enjoying it. And he's like, nah, nah, you'll come. He's got this incredible way about him. And he said, no, nah, you'll come. And uh, you'll take it one day at a time. And you'll just help me out. It'll be an adventure. I was like, all right. I didn't even give up my lease. I, I kept an apartment I was renting in Santa Monica, which I loved. And um, I flew up there with another associate of mine who Terry also asked to join. And um, first day there, literally, true story, Jerry pulls myself and my other associate, a guy named Toby Koppel, into a conference room at Yahoo. And he says, so I don't know about the stuff, you being Terry's guys and just helping him out. That will not fly here. So you need real titles, real jobs. So from this point going forward, you're going to run Corp Dev. Like, Excuse me? He's like, yep, you're going to run Corp Dev. And so that was the beginning of the career path at Yahoo. Well, speaking of career paths, uh, and Yahoo, uh, there have, you know, now that you're Mr. Compassion, I'm Dr. Compassion, I think you're Mr. Compassion. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, you weren't always known as Mr. Compassion. Uh, I think uh, there's a quote that uh, Fred Kaufman told you, wisdom uh, without uh, compassion is ruthlessness and uh, uh, compassion without wisdom is folly. Uh, were you not as compassionate as you are? I was not. Um, I was hardly ruthless. I would never have described myself as ruthless. But and I, was, I didn't mean to do no, that. I just, I, I no, I know. I, I, I was not I was not compassionate. I, I didn't really fully appreciate the meaning. Uh, in the art of happiness, I learned the difference between compassion and empathy, which would later... Uh, be a first principle for me in understanding the difference. Because a lot of people, especially in Western society, have a tendency to use those two things synonymously. So when Jim and I are talking about compassion, we're drawing a very clear distinction where empathy is feeling what another person feels. And compassion is a more objective form of empathy where you can create space between you and the other person's feelings so that you can actually do something about it. And if necessary and possible, alleviate their suffering. So uh, I was not someone who thought a great deal about compassion. I certainly wasn't actively practicing compassion. Uh, I was making the same mistake a lot of younger executives make, uh, which is to project onto others uh, my way of doing things. And that is suboptimal for a whole host of reasons. But it's very natural. You know, human beings are egocentric, not egomaniacal. Uh, let's draw a clear delineation between the two. Egocentric, we see the world through our own perspective, our own experiences. That's how we survive for the most part. And that doesn't necessarily naturally lend itself to compassion, which is why it needs to be actively practiced, learned, studied, and practiced day in and day out. And, you know, when people say that I try to manage compassionately or I focus a great deal on compassion, I always try to correct them. I aspire to manage compassionately, because it's one of the single hardest things I do in managing compassionately and, and try to do it in every interaction. At any rate, going back to my days at Yahoo, uh, I had a fair amount of responsibility. I was a younger executive. I was doing some stuff I'd never done before. And I just expected the people on my team to do the things uh, the way I was doing them. And uh, a game changer for me, I'll never forget it. Uh, I was on another team as well as the people I was responsible for. I was a part of a team with colleagues, and there was a member of that team. And I recall that uh, we would get together uh, at a staff meeting periodically. And um, this particular individual had a tendency to be undermining another member of our team. And that would manifest itself in 
uh, jokes made at this person's expense or obvious frustration that he wasn't necessarily voicing. And it, it just didn't feel good to the people that were sitting around the table. It was very obvious what was going on. And long story short, he was frustrated with the performance of this other individual because the individual wasn't doing things the way my colleague would have done them. And we were at a one-on-one, -on -one and uh, I said to him, you know, the next time you feel like getting frustrated with that person who he was responsible for, I said, you should go find a mirror somewhere and lay into yourself. Because at the end of the day, that person's there because you want them there. And if they're not doing the job the way you want them to do the job, then start coaching them so they can do the job differently. Or better understand their strengths and play to their strengths rather than expect them to magically be able to overcome their weaknesses. Or if it's not a fit, then as constructively as possible, figure out what their next play should be. And he was quiet for a little bit. And he was like, OK, thank you. Let me think about that. And he was very open. And uh, I'll let you know how it goes. A few weeks later, we got together again. And he said, thank you so much for the last one-on-one -on -one we had. That advice was extremely valuable. I took it. And it's really changed my relationship with that individual. I'm playing to their strengths. And they're, they're doing a great job. And I think this is a wonderful place to build from. And as he's saying this, I realized I was doing the exact same thing with a member of my team. The exact same thing. And in that moment, I kind of said to myself, from this point going forward, I'm going to aspire to manage compassionately every chance I get, which is to put myself in the shoes of the people I'm working with in all capacities, understand what it is they aspire to do, understand their hopes, understand their dreams, understand what motivates them, understand their fears, understand their anxieties, understand their vulnerabilities, and work with them so they can ultimately do the things that they want to do to get the most out of them. And it's been a game changer. It was exactly what you said during your introduction in terms of there's, it, it changes everything is how you put it. And as you said, I was thinking to myself, it changes everything. It's interesting. I was in uh, Sydney recently and uh, at a global mindfulness leadership conference. And I was speaking there, <clears throat> and there was an executive there who, of a major, major company, oil and energy company. And he was saying, uh, uh, relating to your comments, he was saying that, uh, you know, I was a very forceful executive. You know, people, you know, would do what I tell them. I expected them to perform, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, we brought in a consulting company to do 360 evaluations on every executive, including myself. And he said, I got, I met with the people afterwards, and they said, in all of our years of doing this, you have actually gotten the worst ratings of any executive that we have interviewed. And he said, that's not possible. And this, again, was his ego fighting reality, right? And uh, he went around to some colleagues and said, is this true? Do and of course, there was a little bit of a silence. So he went home. And he goes to his wife. And he says, I can't believe this. You know, I'm thinking about firing this firm. Uh, because look what they said about me. And she said, why would you fire them? They said, uh, what they said was exactly true. <laughs> and uh, he said, what? And he said, she said, I've been telling you that for 20 years, and you've never listened. And that, for him, was his eye-opening moment. And he completely changed. And uh, the companies that he has run since that time have all been in the upper quadrant of his industry. He's gotten the highest ratings from his employees. And now he has one of the highest positive uh, 360 evaluations. And it really truly does change everything. And there's now a body of literature that examining executives who practice this way, uh, their share price is higher than those other companies in their same industry. And, uh, uh, and the profits are dramatically better. And I think, uh, and maybe you can address this, uh, you know, in the U.S., of course, with the way uh, Wall Street runs, uh, a lot of executives uh, look at things of, you know, I need to perform this quarter. I need to meet my numbers. But before you went public, I think you said to uh, some of the executives, we're going to manage the same way as we did before we went public, and some people question that. What are your thoughts on that? And, and maybe what even are your words to uh, other executives? Uh, so before we went public, one of our board members uh, they asked what kind of public company we were going to be. What kind of public company did I want to run? 
and I, I didn't know what he meant. And I said, uh, let me get back to you. I, I have to think about that. And I gave it a lot of thought. And I came back, and at the next board meeting, I said, uh, we're going to be the same company as a public company that we were as a private company. We're going to have the same culture. We're going to have the same values. We're going to have the same long-term focus. We're going to pursue our vision. We're going to pursue our mission. And after the meeting, our uh, general counsel and CFO uh, pulled me aside. We were very good lieutenants. We didn't want to do this in front of the board. And they said, Psst, Jeff, I know what is it? And they said, you know how you said nothing was going to change? I said, yeah. They said, you, you know that's not going to be the case. I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, one of our values, one of our core values is being open, honest, and constructive. I said, yeah, it's a hallmark of our, of our company. And they said, well, once we're public, you know, you do this all hands every other week. You're completely transparent. You talk about everything. You're not going to be able to do that as a public company. I said, why not? So you just can't. It's not the way it's done. And I said, well, we're going to do it differently. As soon as you start to change that kind of stuff, as soon as you start to compromise your values, your core, you start playing down to the lowest common denominator of what everyone fears is going to happen as a start, as opposed to playing up to the company and the, the team and the person you aspire to be. And so, uh, you know, that was something that we were very thoughtful about and we have been pursuing and trying to manifest ever since. Managing compassionately, you know, another one of our core values is that relationships matter. And for me, the way I interpret that is, is to manage compassionately. And it's something we coach. Uh, we onboard uh, every employee of the company. We coach all of our companies, certainly all of our leaders. Um, virtually every employee of LinkedIn can tell you the difference between empathy and compassion. Uh, they could tell you about what it means to be a spectator of your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional and how critical that is to managing compassionately. Uh, they can tell you that when times get tough, when there's friction or tension in a meeting or with another individual, rather than immediately knee-jerk and assume nefarious intention or politics or territoriality, put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself, what's going on with that person? Are they having a bad day? Do they not have the same knowledge base that you do? Did you tap something that happened to them long before they ever met you? There's a whole host of ways in which we can uh, better practice managing compassionately and uh, it's a game changer. Well, and I, I think that's it. When that sits there with you all the time, it it you it does put you in the position where you're number one, you're interested, you're present, and and you're listening compassionately because whether we like it or not, or whether we realize it or not, I think the interactions we have are often uh, actually not necessarily. Uh, exactly what we wrote down or expected, but are based on either something that happened long ago, something that happened an hour ago, it even could be something you ate. And these affect how you have these interactions. And uh, oftentimes, when you don't handle your own emotions and you are reactive and you don't take that few minutes, so this is one of the hardest things to teach children, right? <laughs> is to uh, sort of have that impulse uh, control. Yes, and uh, I still have that problem sometimes. But uh, uh, but it, it is difficult. So you mentioned actually um, this ability to, uh, if you will, emotionally regulate or have impulse control, uh, and that uh, gets me to sort of the five things you learned from Ray Chambers, and I want to sort of transition into mentoring. And uh, let me see if I can remember this. Uh, be present, emotion regulation, the third one. I'll have to come back to that. Um, oh boy, this is tough. I, I'm not remembering. Finally got stumped. Yeah, you, uh, the fourth one, uh, gratitude. And the fifth one is uh, uh, try to help others. Uh, you want to hit? Yeah, I want to hit. Better to be Oh, oh, love, love, yes, yes, that's it. And I, I think this is actually wonderful because... Better to be loving than right. Yes. I, I think what happens oftentimes when we engage with people and sometimes even a forceful dialogue, you want to, your ego drives you to force your point, and you know you're right. You know you have the facts on your side, but destroying somebody doesn't help them. And it doesn't help you as a result. No, no. And, you know, people have memories, and especially in front of others, and uh, it, it never benefits anybody to uh, 
destroy them or just because you need to have this proof that everyone acknowledges you're right. right. I mean, uh, just to give you my own example, when I was in my training uh, as a neurosurgeon, uh, which was a very arduous uh, many year process, it was a, a very competitive place and uh, I uh, thought I always had to prove I was really smart and would challenge people extraordinarily forcefully. And while I was repeatedly right, at the end of the day, I was absolutely. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, let me, let me. Uh, I almost did a spit take there. Yeah. You can have scripted that better. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but I was right. Uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes. This is genius stuff. Go yeah. ahead. Keep going. But, but, but the reality is, the times I was right, I was actually very wrong because it didn't help me one iota. Right. You know, people oftentimes in surrounding you who you're trying to impress know that what that other person did was either incorrect or, or, or not right. And this desire to, to prove yourself and to, you know, let everyone know you're right, it at the end of the day did not help me one, one bit. And in other ways, it cost me dearly. It cost me at times friendships. It cost me relationships. And it was a, a, a very, uh, very hard lesson. Yeah. The, better to be loving than right is uh, for anyone who is in a uh, relationship, uh, you would understand the inherent challenges of that. And, uh, you know, you talk about a game changer, and that's a place, you know, you can start at home with this stuff because, uh, to your point about just being right, is not necessarily going to benefit anyone. Uh, certainly in your relationships, it, you're in it together. It's not about one person winning and the other person losing. Uh, that's a loss for both of you. Uh, it's, about, it's about winning and building a loving relationship together. And if you can bear that in mind in the throes of trying to win that argument and understand what the other person is thinking, what they're feeling, what they're trying to accomplish, and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, uh, one thing, one exercise you can do in those situations is ask the other person what it is that they want. Because oftentimes, it's not necessarily about being right, but they'll catch themselves and be like, well, I guess I, I didn't realize it, but I'm just trying to win this point. But really what I want is the following. Like they want to be heard. They want to be validated. They want to be loved. They want to accomplish something and achieve something together with you that you're not providing them an avenue to do, as opposed to being right. That's one of myriad examples. So uh, that's challenging. But I think the hardest one uh, by far is to be a spectator of your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional. And I'm, I'm sitting with someone who studied the science because when you become emotional, uh, physiologically certain things are happening that can be very challenging. Uh, to reverse and that's where I think mindfulness and meditation and developing true practices uh, can can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think as many of you know that uh, when you do, once your emotion gets engaged and your amygdala activated, you're losing your executive control and uh, it, uh, it has a huge impact uh, because now you're reacting through fear and not being thoughtful and uh, uh, it takes a long time and it, it, as you say you aspire to be compassionate it takes a great deal of effort uh, to especially in tense situations I think to emotionally regulate yourself you know it's interesting uh, my wife and I had a discussion you may have discussions with your wife sometime and uh, she said you call yourself Dr. Compassion or Mr. Or people call you that well you're Dr. Asshole uh, <laughs> Wait, wait, did she say like Dr. Evil from Austin yes, Powers, yes, or is exactly. that just how you're doing her? No, I think she was doing it like Dr. Evil from uh, Austin Powers. So, uh, you know, again, we aspire to that. We always uh, don't always live up to that. So and I think, so we're laughing on such a serious subject. Uh, one of the most valuable lessons I've learned uh, since I've been at LinkedIn actually was something that I applied at home. And I was asked a question once, uh, being interviewed by a colleague of mine, about uh, lessons I, I've learned at home that I bring to the office. And uh, it turned out that the reverse uh, became very valuable. So all this talk about managing compassionately, this is exactly to your point. And I come to work every day, 
and in all these interactions with people, and there's a number of them, uh, try to be as compassionate as possible. And it requires a tremendous amount of energy, a lot. And that's okay. I love it. I, I wouldn't want to do anything else other than what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, you're pretty depleted. You're pretty done. And I would come home and uh, always want to put the girls to bed and have a wonderful dinner with my wife. And then after that, just veg out. You know, watch a little TV or whatever, just kind of read stuff on your phone. And from time to time, you know, I remember once we were doing some renovations. And at that point, my wife would be like later in the night, okay, I have a bunch of things I need to cover with you. And I'd be like, I, 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 not right now. I mean, really, I don't have the energy for this. And it's been a long day. And then the next night, same thing. And, and I was coming home from work. And at the end of this particular day, I was walking to my car, about to come home. I couldn't wait to see my family. And that particular day felt like a really fulfilling day in terms of practicing the art of, of compassionate management. There was a number of different issues that I thought got resolved. I could see members of the team were starting to take it on themselves. It just felt really good. And as I was getting into my car, it occurred to me I wasn't doing the same thing when I got home. Certainly not at the end of the day, the very end of the day, when my wife was asking me about these renovation decisions. And what, what struck me was, of all the people in the world I need to be the most compassionate with, it's her. It's her. She's the bedrock of everything I have. And so that was the moment where I said, from this point going forward, it's got to start at home. It's got to start at home. It's not just my wife. It's with my kids. You know, think about the times that you get impatient with your children because they're not necessarily listening or they're doing their own thing or the lack of impulse control. I mean, we've all been that for the parents of them. And that you can apply compassion there. You can apply compassion to extraordinary effect as a parent. Uh, mindful parenting is powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And it's interesting to now see, if you will, if you're a religious person, whatever uh, religion you are, all of the uh, core religions at their foundation are about compassion. But I think it's uh, extraordinary that we now see the science behind this, which actually demonstrates how powerful this is and you can understand why this is at the core of uh, religions, which, uh, you know, for 80 to 90 percent of the world uh, are meaningful. And it, it does take work every day to be that way. You know, you had talked about mindfulness or, or meditation. Uh, it's interesting. There can be a dark side of that in some ways, too, for some people. I, I don't know if you've thought about that. or And I'm not talking about meditation on co compassion, but just mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting uh, because some people really get into the meditation part. And I, I was uh, actually up here with Eckhart Tolle, and we were chatting one day. And he gave this wonderful example because it, it gives you this incredible ability to focus and not necessarily react to your uh, emotions, uh, but it uh, can also, for certain types of people, become obsessive. So he was given this example of this individual who came home and would meditate mindfully for about an hour or longer. And, uh, and in this instance, he was actually meditating on compassion. And then his child wa walks in the room and goes, what the hell are you doing interfering with my mindful, compassion mindfulness meditation? <laughs> and, it was, and it was an interesting because you can't get lost in this objective idea of this practice. You have to integrate it uh, uh, into your uh, behavior and how you function every day. And also, I think one way to avoid that is to build into the practice the reason why and to constantly remind yourself of the why. And the why can oftentimes be because of the people you care about. And that I think that helps with the, the integrative component of it. So it's not just about you. Um, uh, one other thing I would say too, to your point about the science, and Jim, you were so far ahead of the curve on this. I mean, you're the living embodiment of this. But I, I just recently was talking to my team at the company, 
and said that it wouldn't surprise me if 2015 is the year uh, mindfulness, meditation, etc., kind of tips and moves from a world that some have pejoratively described historically as new age uh, to mainstream. And one of the reasons I believe that's going to happen is because of the science and the growing body of research and uh, the findings are reaching critical mass on uh, the benefits of this. So it's no longer going to be about, you know, the touchy-feely and uh, it's increasingly going to be about how it makes a difference and in, empirical results. And not only that, but at times how little you need to invest to realize the benefits. And so I, I think the body of work is going to continue to grow and the context uh, with which it is demonstrated is going to expand. So you've been talking uh, tonight about some uh, anecdotes that involved CEOs or business people and I think or the benefits of companies being managed in this way and I, I think this is just going to continue uh, to accelerate. No, I, I think you're right and it's interesting because one of the things we're doing, um, obviously these types of practices uh, have a great personal impact and I can't tell you the number of times individuals who've taken our training or different types of mindfulness training have said, you know, I, I, I did this to help me, but I also have found, uh, you know, this great impact on those I interact with. And I've actually had spouses come to me and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, because this has entirely changed how we interact. And, uh, uh, and then you look at these other domains uh, to get to your point about the science. Uh, and while we're still early with the science, if we look in the domain of education, and, and not necessarily because uh, oftentimes these are touted as the benefit, uh, let's say, in lower socioeconomic school systems, but in any school system in terms of emotion regulation we're in, and issues of being empathetic and compassionate to others, you know, we already see a lot of literature that supports uh, uh, increased academic performance, increased uh, uh, attendance, uh, decreased bullying levels, and then we look in business, which we've just talked about. But I just, uh, in regard to even healthcare, uh, we just did a, uh, a survey that was funded by uh, actually Dignity Health, which showed a significant effect, and they had asked us, because their byline is a low human kindness, and it was interesting because I was chatting with their folks, and they actually ask us to do a survey of all the literature to make sure that this was in fact the case. Now, of course, you would think if you're just kind, uh, that should be the case. But again, doctors interacting empathically, compassionately to individuals, touching an individual, leaning in, being present, having compassion, listening, has a huge, huge impact on outcomes. And then you can just now go to the next level, which is the social justice uh, system, uh, juvenile justice, the prison systems. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, there's a woman in India whose name I can't recall right now, but she has introduced mindfulness practice into the prison systems, and, so, and a horrible system actually, and it's had a profound turning around of that system and actually made the prisoners, if you will, get their dignity back and see hope. And then there's a movement now uh, in civic government called the uh, Compassionate Cities Movement. And uh, again, uh, there's a mayor in Louisville and spreading around the country where they're actually taking the empiric findings from studies and actually using it to uh, solve uh, problems within cities. So it, it really is quite extraordinary. And I think that uh, we're at the, if you will, the early stages of the age of compassion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not going to be solved in the next year or two years or three years. I think it may be like the Age of Enlightenment, but I think uh, this is really what's going to uh, save our planet and our species, if you will. I think, you know, you touched on education for the first time tonight, and I think a huge part of that is going to be ensuring that compassion is taught at a very early age. And one of the things I'm most passionate about and most excited about is uh, developing curriculum and working with schools uh, to figure out a way to make this happen. So that compassion is not a, a nice to have, but becomes as fundamental as reading or math. And uh, there's some wonderful work happening here at a public elementary school in the area, Oak Knoll, where each year they have uh, a word of the year, 
And uh, in years past, a couple years ago, I think it was Courage, and they study people who demonstrate courage, you know, Martin Luther King, etc. Last year it was confidence. This year it's compassion. And they're actually developing as part of the curriculum uh, ways in which the kids can learn to be more compassionate. And I would love to work more closely with the school to figure out what's working, what's not working, and then ultimately share that more broadly regionally and then nationally to figure out how we can continue to grow this, this effort. Actually, we should probably talk at some point after this. Uh, we're actually uh, uh, do conferences. We've done Compassion Technology, Compassion Business, and actually our next one is actually uh, Compassion Education. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a uh, large, uh, in fact, it will ultimately be the largest uh, study of its kind that's ever been performed, which is a longitudinal study over five years uh, in uh, a multi-grade school system in the city of Louisville. Uh, and this is, if you will, a, a mayor who has run on a platform of compassion. Uh, but uh, we're engaged with that. We're going to actually have a conference uh, uh, probably during the summer on this, and actually uh, we're even going to be doing a, uh, I, and hopefully we can get this done, a summer camp teaching compassion to kids from like 7 to 12, so we're sort of uh, working on that right now. Have you seen uh, a class divided? Yeah. Have, seen a, have, have any people in the audience seen a class divided? Highly, highly recommend it to anyone who is interested about uh, whether or not compassion can be taught and compassion in the education system. Uh, uh, elementary school teacher in the segregated South uh, the day after uh, Martin Luther King uh, was assassinated uh, felt like she needed to do something. And so she split her class of all white kids in half. And uh, on the first day, it was light eyes and, and dark eyes. And on the first day, she gave the light-eyed children all the privileges. And the dark-eyed children were subjugated to the light-eyed kids. And it was amazing to her how quickly they all fell into these roles and how quickly the, the folks with the, the kids with the privileges felt an air of entitlement and how mean and nasty they got. And conversely, uh, how the kids that were subjugated, how they lost their confidence and how they allowed themselves to be bullied. But the real learning was the next day when she flipped it. And so she started doing this year in and year out and uh, they did a documentary on her. And uh, uh, PBS uh, Frontline covered it. And uh, years later, uh, 10, 15 years later, uh, they went back and they interviewed the kids who had been in the class. And almost to a person, uh, they were huge proponents of the civil rights movement. And bear in mind where they had grown up. And uh, I stumbled across that serendipitously late night, years and years ago, I was thinking to myself, can compassion be taught? And I ended up watching that, and uh, it's really powerful. Now, you cannot do that study now. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it. it uh, and, and in some ways, the sad thing is how quickly you can revert to this. And it also shows you how you can destroy somebody by a label. Mm -hmm. Become self-fulfilling very yes, quickly. Yes, absolutely. And that's really uh, one of the sad things because I think the other thing you can learn from this is, well, obviously, we all have to listen to others and, and hopefully be open to constructive criticism. At the same time, and maybe it gets back to what your father said, you have the ability to do anything you choose to do. But <clears throat> I think, uh, unfortunately, people listen to what others tell them that they can't do and it can be so limiting and to be able to learn to listen to your own voice and actually move forward with that confidence and not necessarily let others decide who you are or what you're going to be. And, and very specifically to not give your power to others and to not generate a sense of self or self-esteem by virtue of things you can't control. You know, if you think about it, a lot of people have a tendency to base their self-esteem on things that are highly variable. You know, you think about it, you know, good-looking people, their physical appearance is going to change over time. Look age, what's happened to me. Age, catch, <laughs> age catches up to everybody, although some people would like to, you know, they, they do certain things to prevent it, but other people derive their self-esteem um, from their position, their title, and perhaps they can't control that. Even if you start your own company, you can't necessarily control the macroeconomy. 
uh, you may be deeply in love with someone in a relationship, a loving, caring relationship. You can't control the other person. And what you can control is the kind of person that you are and how you treat others. And if people can derive self-esteem from that, from things like compassion, then you'll be in a position where you won't give, in, give your power to other people, to other dynamics, to other forces, but you can control more of that. And I, I think that's important. Uh, have any of you heard of Epictetus? Is this a disease? Oh. It sounds like something you need to get vaccinated for. <laughs> well, I'm just testing it. You obviously know. Uh, well, there's one person over there, Kunal. Uh, uh, so Epictet Epictetus was a uh, Stoic philosopher, and he was a slave. And uh, uh, that's one of his teachings, actually, uh, is that the only thing I can control is my own reaction mm -hmm. and how I decide. Nobody can choose how I feel. Only I can do that. And, and, it, and that is an extraordinarily powerful thing. But again, is that God? <laughs> oh. A very <laughs> soothing alarm. Yes. Do all of you know Ming? Raise your hand. Ming was uh, and hit the team that uh, is uh, bringing us what one billion acts of peace was nominated for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. I found this out on my Facebook page. So, uh, so, so Ming is one of my heroes, and he's actually uh, one of our extraordinary benefactors. And I'm. I thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> where were we? Um, let's talk about mint. Oh, we talked about them. But now, have you guys read? Have you Googled them so far since we've been sitting here? Um, maybe I'll put something on LinkedIn about him. Um, <laughs> one of the things uh, we were talking about uh, uh, mentors. And uh, um, it's, uh, I can't think of his first name. Is it uh, Chambers? Uh, Ray. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So Ray. Um, but you've had other mentors, and you know uh, one of the the fifth uh, lesson, if you will, of Ray's uh, five uh, is about helping others. How I tell people, and one of the things I have always promoted is the fact number one. Uh, each of us has the ability to impact another in a positive way every day. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be wealthy. Uh, just by how you interface with people, you can care. You can be a mentor. How do you uh, do mentoring? What, what is it that you see in terms of how you teach that to others, how you serve as an example? And who have been the biggest mentors in your own life? Well, for mentors, I mean, um, A is a, someone I consider a mentor, and uh, uh, Fred Kaufman has been enormously influential. My parents have been incredibly influential. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about my dad, but my mom taught me to read at a very early age, and uh, it was extremely empowering. And uh, I've always been kind of intellectually curious and passionate about learning, and that's, uh, that's been with me my entire life. And I think a big part of that was the ability to read uh, when I did, so whenever I had a question, I could I could find more about it. So uh, those were uh, th those are very influential people on on myself. Uh, in terms of the way I mentor, uh, I guess it starts with uh, listening and just trying to understand what it is that someone, uh, I guess, in a career capacity, which is where some of the mentorship starts, what they're trying to accomplish. You know, I, I like to ask people. You look out 20 to 30 years from now, and then you look back. What do you want to say you accomplished with your career? And to do what I can to ensure they're on the right path. Sometimes uh, just asking the question alone uh, can be a difference maker because it's amazing how many folks just get swept up in this stream of opportunity, one opportunity after another. It goes all the way back to when you graduate school, and you're not necessarily given thought to what it is you ultimately want to accomplish, or what you're most passionate about, or what you're best at. Uh, but you start a job, and then you get a headhunter calling, and you're on to another job, and then this really hot company reaches out, and you do that, and then you get paid more money, 
And the next thing you know, 15, 20 years has gone by and you're not necessarily happy and you're trying to figure out why that is. And it may have something to do with the fact you never really took the time to ask yourself what it is you want to do. So I think that that's a, a place where I like to focus with the folks that uh, have asked me for help. And, you know, just staying open to, to whatever they need. Uh, it, it could be talking about managing compassionately. It could be about building teams, scaling companies. Uh, it could be about uh, their practice in terms of some of the things we were talking about earlier, mindfulness or compassion, uh, helping to resolve conflict. I mean, whatever people need. I, I take it very seriously. And so when someone reaches out to me and says, would I you know, be open to the idea of mentoring them? That's something you want to give a lot of thought to and, and not just say yes and glad hand everybody because uh, it's a big investment in being there for someone and taking the time to really fundamentally understand who they are, what they're trying to accomplish, and to just be there for them. So that's the way I, I guess I kind of approach it. You know, you were talking about helping others. Mentorship is one way of helping others. Uh, philanthropy is another. And as you were talking, you were saying that you can always help. I, I was just reminded of uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, uh, the biography of Paul Farmer, who's the guy that created Partners in Health, uh, an extraordinary guy. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Paul uh, was educated at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, went on to be a teacher, a doctor, and uh, had, uh, had a connection with Haiti uh, through his upbringing. And uh, once he was practicing medicine, uh, would commute, believe it or not, on weekends to central Haiti, uh, which is uh, the most impoverished region in the Western Hemisphere. And he would go down uh, to administer health care to one person at a time. He'd commute from Cambridge to central Haiti on weekends. And word started to spread and enough people needed help that he built a facility, he built an organization. Jim Kim helped him, he's now president of the World Bank. And uh, word started to spread. And these guys have just completely reshaped global healthcare and the way in which uh, we treat the poorest amongst us. And historically, there were very specific uh, protocols and parameters and evaluations and analysis in terms of returns and so forth and so on. And these guys, they just changed all that. And what the book taught me, uh, it was enormously valuable, was that sometimes changing the world starts by helping one person at a time. And uh, that's, that's been a first principle in terms of philanthropy. And you know, organizations like the Bur Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula uh, to me, uh, do so much good in our community, uh, providing enormously talented kids with the right mentorship, the right opportunities. These people, they, these kids, they don't need charity. If you meet them and you see how extraordinarily talented they are, uh, they don't need charity. They need access. They need access to opportunities. And we can all make a difference, you know, one person at a time that way. I'll tell you a real quick story. Just to, when you mentioned that, it reminded me of a woman I met, and I used to go to the same Starbucks to get coffee, and she was a barista. And one day I brought my son in, <clears throat> and uh, she said hello, and she said I have a nine-year-old, and this began a conversation that turned out, and we began chatting. She was a single mother, and uh, I started chatting with her, and I said, you know, why are you working here? What is your aspiration? She says to go to medical school. And she said, you know, I've been trying, da 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 I have to work. She told me her story. It was really quite a moving story. And I said, well, what can I do to help you? And so, uh, and I'm not saying this to promote myself. I, I'm just saying this, though. This is the power that each of us have. And so I met with her a few times, looked over all her stuff, and, uh, uh, and then ended up helping her organize it, writing a few letters, and she's now a medical student. So... It, it, it is so powerful, the ability we have to potentially just change somebody's life just by even a few interactions. Because all of us have talents, we have skills, and a lot of people actually, until you open yourself up, aren't going to ask. You just need to have an open heart and be there. Um, we're going to ask a few questions. We have about 10 minutes, I think. Uh, if anyone has any questions for uh, Jeff, uh, there are microphones here. 
uh, or I guess we've answered all the questions. <laughs> uh, it's for the benefit of the audience. Okay. Okay. So what are we doing to help train people along this, these lines in this practice? So uh, we've been talking about Fred Kaufman and that book Conscious Business, for example. So uh, we hired him. <laughs> so he's full time at LinkedIn. And um, all kidding aside, uh, he develops programs for uh, LinkedIn and for our company. And one of the reasons he was so attracted to the opportunity was because of our publishing platform. Everything that he's doing with us and developing with us, um, he's sharing with the world. And so uh, anyone can benefit from the things that we're benefiting from. Um, that's one example of many. Uh, we, we invest very heavily in our learning and development uh, program. We've got a big team, very talented team of folks. And so they work with Fred, they work with others uh, to basically uh, understand uh, what's working, what's not working. Uh, and it ties back to our culture, it ties back to our values, it, it ties back to our mission. You know, we have a very clear understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish. And not only what we're trying to accomplish, but how we want to accomplish it. And that really heavily colors the way in which we're coaching and the way in which we're developing. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you can find the right people, um, if you can make the right investment in your learning and development programs. It, it also, we're a culture, you know, we have five dimensions to our culture. And the first and most important one is we're a culture of transformation. And we want every employee of LinkedIn to be able to transform the trajectory of their career. It's the same brand promise we offer to our members. We want every employee to benefit from that. And that means doing a lot of things that we've been talking and, and practicing those things. Walking the walk, not just talking the talk, which is understanding what our folks want to do, what they ultimately want to accomplish. And you know what? Sometimes it's not going to happen at LinkedIn. And that's okay. Because as long as they're at LinkedIn, if they can create value for our members, our customers, for the company, uh, we want to make sure that we're creating value for them. So those are some of the approaches that we take. Yes, sir. So first of all, I want to thank you for everything you've shared. It's uh, actually very inspiring. Thank you. And uh, so I work for a very large high-tech company in the Silicon Valley. In fact, it's the largest employer in the Silicon Valley. It shall remain nameless, save for that last that's, data point. That's correct. Which now anyone can look up <laughs> on a search engine. I, oh, sorry. My official role And this is, has been video, and we'll be on it. OK. My we'll edit this part out. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, my official role is that I manage a team of sales engineers, who we all know engineers are some of the most compassionate people on the planet, naturally. <laughs> but my unofficial role is I'm actually trying to drive initiatives that create more emotional intelligence and compassion within our 8,000 person sales force. I've actually been able to gain quite a bit of traction within the last two years, but I'd love to get your advice on what I could do as basically sort of a front mid-level management person and convince more executives about the benefit of having a compassionate culture. And let's just say that our organization is not known for its compassion, but there are many people who are very open to it. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, I would start qualitatively with uh, what the downside would be. Th there's no downside to practicing compassion. You know, Jim was talking earlier about the unintended consequences of getting very focused on meditation. Um, with compassion, I'm not sure I've ever heard of someone say, yeah, that whole compassion thing, you know, you got to be wary of the following because it could go off the rails. <laughs> yeah. uh, you just become so nice. Yeah. <laughs> you alleviated so much suffering in the yeah. world. Too much. Uh, so uh, if for whatever reason that doesn't work, uh, you know, you can talk about the benefits. And I'm glad you're bringing this up because we've been talking about compassion in the context of, uh, at least in the case of LinkedIn, our employees. But for us, managing compassionately holds for every constituent of the company in our ecosystem, all of them. When we went public, we were talking about how we could do the offering as compassionately as possible, putting ourselves in the shoes of our investors. Seriously, I'm not saying this because it sounds good. I mean it. And with regard to our salespeople, we just had this discussion the other day. Someone was talking about the way in which they were selling. And we were talking about whether or not we were adding as much value to that customer as possible. Put aside whether or not we were maximizing the sale, which is where that conversation had been heading. And that's not necessarily how to maximize value, long-term value in that situation. It's going to be making sure that the customer is benefiting, not just us. Uh, with regard to engineers, uh, in addition to Fred, 
Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have some other professionals within LinkedIn who have been dedicating to, dedicated to developing programs for our team. One of the programs is for our engineering team because our head of engineering is so committed to getting this right. Mm -hmm. And whereas he may have been a little bit skeptical in the beginning, he very quickly saw the benefits of having an engineering team, starting with our engineering leadership, starting to take this approach. And imagine a room full of engineering leaders who are trying to tackle problems, not just through a traditional lens, but in addition to all that technical brilliance and the being right, actually thinking about where the other person's coming from and how you take those conversations to a completely different level. Seriously, yeah. when you have a room full of brilliant technologists who are trying to understand where the other person's coming from and not just be right, you get a much better answer. So in every functional area within your company, you're going to benefit and you're going to benefit materially. Excellent. Thank you. You know, just a comment, I mean, my own experience has been, and I think this has been uh, also shown by uh, studies, is that once somebody actually understands this and really gets it, they work far, far harder or more committed. You can't pay them enough because they are inherently receiving the benefit. The Dalai Lama has said, I'm sure you've heard this, if you uh, want to be happy, be compassionate. If you want others to be happy, be compassionate. And you just feel this uh, the more you do it. And, uh, uh, you know, some people do say, uh, uh, geez, I'm in this company and uh, it's really hard because the management doesn't get this. I want to try and be a better person, be compassionate. And I've struggled and struggled. And, and for some people, though, maybe it's time you looked at another because it's not making you happy. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, at the uh, end of the day. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Natasha and I work for the smallest company in Silicon Valley, my own. Um, love LinkedIn, by the way, great company. My question is related to how can we help to take mindfulness mainstream? Because I'm sure you see that a lot too, especially in the tech community. As soon as you talk about mindfulness and meditation, people's eyes glaze over and they say, oh yeah, that fufu stuff. And they don't really believe it, even though science supports it. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky to be here for the compassion retreat a few weeks ago, uh, for two days. And uh, the bottom line was meditation is a really good tool to create compassion, to give, go from reacting to responding. But how... Do you get people to start meditating that one minute a day? Because I also teach yoga and I know this one minute a day meditation for people seems a hurdle that they cannot surmount for some reason. And uh, at the same time, I would be interested what your meditation practice is and what you do at LinkedIn. And I just wanted to throw in my uh, yoga guru always says when people come to the meditation class, uh, uh, I understand you're too busy, you have to go shopping, you have to do this. You could meditate for a minute and find eternal bliss, but sorry, I'm too busy, I have to go and do this. So I think one of the reasons, and Jim will probably be able to comment on the science behind this, but I think one of the reasons it's so challenging, whether it's through yoga uh, or through meditation, why it's so challenging for people to quiet their mind is I think the active mind sabotages that process where it wants that next hit of dopamine or serotonin or whatever else it, it, we're thriving off of with that next article we have to read or the next email we need to get through. There, there's some real physiological stuff taking place there. So, it, it, you know, you have to rise above that. And starting, I, I don't know about a minute a day. I, I haven't heard about the minute a day practice. That, that sounds interesting. Um, for me, I started with an application recently called Headspace. Uh, which starts with 10 minutes a day. Um, show of hands, how many people know Headspace? Let's take a step back. Show of hands, how many people uh, have an active meditation practice? Wow, that's great. For those that didn't raise your hand and you have an interest in meditating, I've been meaning to meditate, really meditate, develop a practice for at least the last few years. And I just could never get going. I was very similar to your friends or your, your customers uh, for the yoga practice. And... I finally turned to a number of people who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, who I knew meditated. 
and I said, uh, recommend, what's the best way to get started? What's the best way to learn? How should I do this? And virtually every, I was not expecting it, every single one of them recommended a book and then Headspace. So I got the app, I downloaded the app, and it's 10 minutes a day for the first 10 days. Then there's an upsell and you gotta buy it. And that's okay, <laughs> I'm still gonna promote it because I think it's extraordinary. Um, and the next series is 15 minutes and you keep building. And uh, th that's, that's my practice, that has been my practice thus far. Uh, I have found the benefits to be almost immediate. And so recently there's a, a lot of research coming out that would suggest it only requires, Jim, I guess about eight weeks for there to be significant and measurable changes in terms of uh, some of the pathways in the brain. Uh, but I would suggest it happened much faster than that. And I have felt, and I, I don't think it's a placebo effect. I'm being very honest with myself, but in a very short period of time, I started to experience a degree of clarity and uh, lucidity and an ability to prioritize a single-mindedness that I just was not experiencing prior to that. And the best part of all is that I'm now much more capable of quieting down the active mind that wants to kind of get in the way and say, yeah, that meditation thing might be nice, but we still have to clear out the inbox. And so it builds on itself, and I think that's a very positive thing. Historically, I've had a different kind of mindful practice, which I've talked about quite a bit and at times has been interpreted, interpreted as uh, true meditation, but that was not what it was, uh, which are buffers. So at work, every day, I have on the order of 90 minutes to two hours a day that's carved out for buffer time when nothing's scheduled. It's not always one block, as, as a matter of fact, very rarely is it one block, but it'll be 30 minutes, maybe three times a day, or an hour here and 30 minutes there. And if you were to see my schedule printed out, you'd see these big gray blocks. And it's done very much by design because I have found I, I'm just not capable of doing my job if I have every minute of every day scheduled. And I can't think. I just need to think sometimes. Uh, and that thinking can take all, all kinds of forms. I mean, it could be uh, taking the time to think about a strategy that is going to be critical to getting right. Uh, it could be taking the time to coach someone uh, unscheduled who really needs it. It could be taking a walk around the campus, clear your head. It could be clearing out your inbox. As counter as that sounds, the more those emails keep building up, the more pressure you feel to clear it out. Remember that I Love Lucy, Lucy episode where she's trying to clear the chocolates <laughs> off the conveyor belt? Yeah. That's what I think the modern day inbox is. And so if you have a chance to kind of get through it and you can develop that cadence, uh, that's liberating. That frees up other cycles to focus in other areas. So uh, this notion that we have to have every minute of every day fully scheduled or, or else we're not doing our jobs, I think is the exact opposite how it really works. I think when we have scheduled every minute of every day from the moment we get to the office to the moment we leave, that's when we're not doing our jobs. So those are some ways in which I, I kind of incorporate the practice. We're going to have one more question. There are about a hundred of us that have been trained in the compassion cultivation training that's provided here at Stanford. And it is coincidentally an eight-week program that really helps build a compassion layer cake for people and brings them to more compassion for themselves, for people they love, for difficult people and also to this, this sense of a common humanity. And so for those who don't have the opportunity to hire somebody in-house to create a training program that's customized, which I think is excellent, that eight-week turnkey program in compassion cultivation could be a good starting tool. And so pivoting off of that question, I want to ask you, Jeff, as we look at corporations as key pivot points of change in the society, and we have these great programs. We have the Compassion Cultivation Training Program here at Stanford. We have the Search Inside Yourself program that Meng started that is now going out into the corporations. What would be your number one piece of advice for executives who want to implement compassion into their culture? What is your number one advice for them to, to get this infiltrated? Because knowing, of course, all of these great companies, especially here in Silicon Valley, have the ability to impact the world. So the number one piece of advice, if it were only limited to one, uh, would be to walk the walk. So it's one thing to talk about it. Okay, how about three? <laughs> <laughs> so first and foremost is walk the walk. This all sounds great. 
it's really hard to debate and argue. Like I, we were half joking earlier, why wouldn't you want to be more compassionate? It's another thing altogether to practice, and in particular, to practice uh, within a company when there's going to be natural tension. Uh, you're competing intensely. It's just really challenging. So walk the walk. Start with the individual leader that you cited. Hypothetically, it starts with them. And the more invested they are in managing compassionately, in developing their own practice, uh, in starting to bring in the right kind of teachers, the right kind of programs and materials, it'll start to cascade. It, it really can work that way. Uh, so that, I guess, would be the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice would be you can't do it alone. And the culture and the values of a company, that tone is set at the top. It has to be tops down and bottoms up. It doesn't work uh, in only one direction. But without the right leadership team who believes in this, it's going to be really challenging. Because you may have some people on the team that are going to embrace it and some that don't. And the ones that don't will have teams throughout the organization that aren't practicing it. And then you've got some teams that are and some teams that aren't. And that, that's going to make for some really interesting reality television shows at some point. So I, I think the leadership team has to be committed to it. And, and not just because their boss says it's important, but because they want it, because it's important to them. And then to cascade it and to, to ensure that it's being manifested at every turn. And you know, it's one thing to print this stuff on the walls of your company or you know, produce those laminated cards that people are supposed to put in their wallets. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we have some of this stuff on our walls. And I think it, it, you know, it looks great, but that's not what this is about. And uh, people have to practice it in everything you do. Uh, if it's going to be a fundamental part of your culture, you have to recruit against it. You have to onboard against it. You have to develop against it. And you have to evaluate performance against it. So I think all of those things can help. Great. Thank you very much. OK, one more. I'm being very compassionate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Hemant, and I think I'm going to stir the pot a bit with this question that came to my mind because you said that you know, mindful, mindfulness meditation is now at this point when it will go into the mainstream. And the other thing that just struck me was, you know, what the, you know, at least this is my perception that clinical depression is also going mainstream in a way. There is clinical. A, Depression, depression as people, uh, mental health is becoming an issue more and more in modern society. And I would really be curious to hear your thoughts and what, how do you see it correlating? Because we are running faster and faster. We're doing things which essentially means we can pack more into a day. And how does it go back to, you know, where do you think mindfulness meditation will come into as an intervention? Yeah, well, I'm going to turn it over to the good doctor in a second yeah. because when you when you say clinical depression, I mean that's a very specific and, and serious thing. What I, I would say is that modern day society is about as opposed or counter to mindfulness as you can get. You think about the age of information overload that we live in. We are just constantly inundated. Constant, it's never ending, and it's increasingly ubiquitous by virtue of mobile computing devices. It's everywhere. And whenever you're going through a feed on any site, you know, our site, any of the social platforms, it just never stops. It never stops. And it is playing off of these natural human tendencies we have to be heard, to be seen, to keep up with others. And you know, it's probably more challenging than ever with regard uh, to our environment to be able to take the time to become more mindful and to develop the practice. And it's what we were talking about earlier, which is I increasingly think, it's purely anecdotal, I'm sure there's science behind it, but our active minds, the more active they become, the more they will seek to get in the way and prevent us from becoming more mindful. So hopefully, uh, you know, Jim's right, and this is the age of mindfulness, the age of compassion, that we're going to be doing this, uh, you know, up and down the stack, starting in primary schools and primary education, going all the way up to the leaders of these big influential companies, uh, through science, through medicine. Uh, 
to you know one of the challenges, and uh, it's interesting because 25% of people, if they're asked, will tell you that they have no one to talk to when they feel pain or suffering. 25% of the people in the Western world. And one of the reasons is, is because we have this dispersed family, right? You don't live with your parents or your grandparents don't live with you. Your brothers or sisters are everywhere. I mean, somebody can sit in a cubicle for years and have somebody next to them, and that person knows nothing about them other than they say hello. Yet that person can be suffering deeply, yet they don't feel it is an open environment to have that communication. If you have no outlet for your suffering, and uh, as Jeff was saying, uh, in our ever-increasing age of information, and you're overwhelmed, uh, what that does is it increases stress. Now, there's something called, if you will, use stress, or you know, there's a certain amount of stress that's good. It, it promotes creativity, it promotes engagement. Uh, uh, but when stress becomes overwhelming and chronic, that's when you start having these very negative effects. And it's interesting because... Uh, as we're seeing with the promotion of, of many of these programs of mindfulness and uh, introspection and compassion, uh, this is, if you will, what will allow people to deal with these issues. And it's, dem it's having a demonstrable effect. You know, it's interesting. We have a partnership here at Stanford with a number of the major technology companies. And what we have given them is, okay, we're going to give you a program on diabetes, and we're going to give you a program on this. Well, what they really need is we need to give them a program on how to live a healthy life and how to deal with stress because the largest cost of health care for many of these companies is the following. It's stress, anxiety, depression. And it's huge. It's a huge, huge problem. And it shows you the failure of our society. And as Jeff was saying, unfortunately, the way our, our minds evolved not to deal with the modern world. And it is this constant information and this constant response to things which creates fear and stress and anxiety because you cannot attend to everything. Yet you're always looking around wondering if you're somehow missing something. And it's very difficult. Now the extraordinary thing though is with this types of practices, we know it can have a profound effect on your health. It is more powerful in terms of your health than being at your ideal body weight, exercise, or quitting smoking. That is how profound these types of practices are in terms of your long-term health. So it, it is really quite extraordinary. And the other amazing thing, although it's not easy sometimes, it's completely free. So. The uh, you know to, to end on a positive note, the good news is that the same technology that's facilitating the overload also facilitates our ability to scale these solutions at greater speed than at any time in the history of civilization. So when we find out what works, we can spread the word and we can encourage others. And people like Ming and people like Jim and people who've come before us tonight on this stage are now in a position where they can leverage these platforms to help millions of people in ways that were never possible before. And uh, speaking of that, we are going to have our next conversation on compassion is actually with an engineer who's just completed a book on uh, compassionate engineering. So uh, he will be here soon. And uh, we are also going to have uh, one of the founders of Headspace here. So uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Jeff. It was really a delight. Thank you all. And, uh,